Thanks for listening to VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Susan Shand and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first... The U.S. State Department and Department of Homeland Security recently announced the expansion of a program to help some minors from Central America legally enter the U.S. The Central American Minors Program permits immigrant parents or legal guardians in the United States to seek their children's resettlement in the U.S. The Biden administration restarted the program in March after a four-year break. Officials say expansion of the Central American Miners Program could make up to 100,000 people eligible to come to the U.S. Some minors can be given permission to travel to the country if they are sponsored by a parent or guardian already living legally in the U.S. To be eligible for CAM, the applicant must be unmarried, under 21, and a citizen of El Salvador, Guatemala, or Honduras. No money is required to apply. Eligible minors must also complete a security investigation before being brought to the United States. Miriam Abaya is Senior Director for Immigration and Children's Rights at First Focus on Children. The group works to support the needs of children and families in federal policy and budget decisions. Abaya says the CAM program involves a multi-step process. The first step involves the parent completing an application through the refugee resettlement process. Next, there is a process to confirm the child's relationship with the applicant. Then, officials speak with the child to decide whether or not the child is eligible for refugee status or for parole in the U.S. Being paroled is a temporary status that permits a migrant to enter the country but without a path to permanent residency, also known as a green card. By comparison, entering as a refugee can lead to permanent status. If you get refugee status once you arrive in the U.S., you have lawful status so you can adjust to get a green card, Abaya said. She noted that eligibility for refugee status is very specific and that many CAM applicants may not be eligible. If you get paroled into the country, then you don't necessarily have permanent status in the U.S., but you're permitted to be in the country for a temporary period of time, she said. Immigration experts say... The program was slow to process applicants from the start. The first minors began arriving in the U.S. in November 2015. That was almost a year after CAM's creation under the administration of former President Barack Obama. By the end of 2016, more than 10,500 applications were waiting to be processed. That information comes from a report by the Niskanen Center, a public policy research group in Washington, D.C. The U.S. resettled 3,000 minors before stopping the program in 2017 and canceling the acceptance of 2,700 children who had not yet entered the U.S. 
during the Obama administration, parents who had received aid were permitted to apply for their children. Under the Biden administration's relaunching of the program, a parent or legal guardian in the U.S. who has an undecided asylum or a U visa legal case can also file an application. U visas are for victims of some crimes who have assisted U.S. law enforcement investigations. Critics of the program note that it is unlikely to greatly reduce the number of unaccompanied minors crossing the U.S.-Mexico border without permission. Chuck Grassley is the top Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee. He said in a statement, "I'm worried that this effort is going to be somehow passed off." As an effort to address the number of migrants at the southern border, when it does nothing to stem the flow or address the crisis created by this administration, immigrant supporters have welcomed the restart of the CAM program. However, they note that eligibility does not cover the full number of family members who may wish to apply to bring a minor to the U.S. Miriam Abaya said, "It's not just parents and legal guardians that care for children. There are aunts. There's a grandparent who is in the United States, and those family members don't have any way to apply." Kong's only remaining pro-democracy newspaper, the Apple Daily, will publish its final edition Thursday. The Hong Kong and Chinese governments have increased pressure on the Apple Daily in recent years for its reporting. The publication was forced to shut down. After five editors and business officials were arrested, police froze millions of dollars of the company's assets. The move was part of China's increasing battle against the pro-democracy movement in the semi-autonomous city. The board of directors of Next Media, which owns the Apple Daily, said in a statement Wednesday. That the print and online newspapers will no longer publish because of circumstances in Hong Kong. The closure is the latest sign of China's efforts to control the city. Hong Kong experienced huge anti-government protests in 2019, that worried the government in Beijing. Since then. China has put into effect national security laws that were used to arrest the newspaper's employees. China has also changed Hong Kong's election laws to keep opposition members out of the legislature. Apple Daily was founded by Hong Kong citizen Jimmy Lai in 1995. That was two years before Britain returned Hong Kong to China. At first, the newspaper gained little attention. It was mostly known for covering famous people. Lai changed the newspaper, and it became a voice for defending Hong Kong's freedoms. In recent years, it criticized the Chinese and Hong Kong governments for limiting those freedoms. China had promised to protect Hong Kong's laws when the city was returned to China in 1997. On Instagram, the paper thanked its readers: "We need to continue living and keep the determination we have shared 
with Hong Kong people that has remained unchanged over 26 years, Apple Daily wrote. The decision to close the newspaper was expected after the arrests and asset seizure. The company could not pay its employees and was also worried about their safety. The editors and executives were detained on suspicion of plotting with foreigners to endanger national security. Police said more than 30 stories published by the newspaper were evidence of a plot to get foreign nations to place sanctions on Hong Kong and China's leaders. It was the first time the national security law had been used against reporters for something they had published. Lai is facing charges under the national security law for plotting with foreigners. He is now serving a prison sentence for his involvement in the 2019 protests. Also, the trial of Tong Ying Kit began on Wednesday. He is the first person to stand trial under the new national security law. He has pleaded not guilty to charges of terrorism and inciting secession during the 2019 protests. A court ruled last month that Tong will stand trial without a jury and will face a group of three judges. That move is a change from Hong Kong's common law tradition. It was made by the new national security law. The United States, European Union, and Britain have criticized the moves against the Apple Daily. I'm Susan Shand. Online services that use computers to interview job seekers were increasingly used by companies during the coronavirus health crisis. But the technology raises questions about whether a machine can correctly or fairly judge a person's personality and reactions in front of a camera. Dana Anthony is one job seeker who has experienced such interviews. One was for a part-time job at Target last year. The day after the interview, she got an email informing her that she was not chosen. Speaking to the Associated Press, Anthony said she did not know why she was removed from consideration so quickly. She had no sense of how the interview had gone. She said this is because she received no human feedback during the process. Her rejection email from Target stated, we're unable to provide specific feedback regarding your candidacy. Anthony was rejected for another job in December after completing another online interview. One interview system is run by a business called HireVue, one of the leading companies in the field. In the past, the Utah-based HireVue used artificial intelligence methods to judge a job seeker's personality and job skills. It did this by observing the expressions on a person's face during the interview. But after facing intense criticism about the scientific effectiveness of its claims and the possibility of unfairness, HireVue announced earlier this year that it would stop using that method.
However, the company's AI-based system still considers speech and word choices when rating a candidate's personality and skills. HireVue helped create a market for on-demand video interviews. Companies using the services include stores, Target and IKEA, technology companies like Amazon, and banks like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Companies in the oil and travel industries, and even school systems, have used them. The Associated Press spoke to several employers which use the technology, but most did not want to discuss it. HireVue chief Kevin Parker told the AP that his company makes sure its technology will not discriminate based on things like race, gender, or a person's speaking accents. He said its systems, which turn speech into text to make decisions about job skills, can perform better than human interviewers. What we're trying to replace is people's gut instinct, Parker said during a video interview. HireVue said it interviewed more than 5.6 million people around the world in 2020. Supermarket companies used it to make decisions about thousands of job seekers every day as demand for workers rose during the pandemic. Other services such as Modern Hire and Outmatch have started offering their own video interviews and AI tools. On its website, Outmatch says it aims to measure the must-have soft skills your candidates and employees need to succeed. HireVue noted that most of the companies it works with do not actually use the company's AI-based recommendations. Atlanta's school district, for example, has used HireVue since 2014, but says it depends on 50 human recruiters to rate recorded interviews. Target said the pandemic led it to replace in-person interviews with HireVue interviews. But it told the AP that it uses its own employees, not HireVue's AI methods, to watch and make decisions about recorded videos. But none of that was clear to Anthony when she sat down in front of her computer to complete the interviews. I understand companies or organizations trying to be more mindful of the time and the finances they spend when it comes to recruitment, she said. But Anthony, who holds a master's degree in communications, said the interviews left her uneasy about who or what was judging her. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about James Garfield. He was the 20th President of the United States. Garfield is not one of the best-known presidents. He served only 100 days before he was shot. Eleven weeks later, he died from his wounds. But even during Garfield's short time in office, historians say his presidency had problems.
Like the president before him, Rutherford B. Hayes, Garfield was from the state of Ohio. Garfield's father died when he was very young. The future president was raised largely by his mother, two older sisters, and a brother. Among all the presidents, Garfield probably was the most poor in his early years. Growing up, he worked as a farmer, a sailor, a carpenter, a teacher, and a janitor. Finally, he earned a position as a student at Williams College in western Massachusetts. Garfield loved learning. He eventually taught at a school called the Eclectic Institute. Later, he became its president. Garfield married one of his students at the Eclectic Institute, Lucretia Rudolph. She became a teacher, too. The future president and his wife went on to have seven children. Four sons and a daughter survived to adulthood. In time, Garfield moved out of education and into law and politics. He was an anti-slavery activist who did not think the southern states had a right to withdraw from the Union. When the Civil War came, Garfield welcomed it. During the war, Garfield served in the military as an officer. He won awards for his bravery. While still a young man, he was appointed to the position of Major General. His image as a war hero was so great that Garfield did not have to campaign for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. He was elected on his name alone. Garfield's way of thinking changed while he was in Congress. He began as one of the most extreme, radical Republicans. He wanted to punish former Confederate officers severely. But in time, Garfield softened his positions. He learned to compromise with other groups in order to achieve results for his state. But he did not always represent the interests of workers or farmers in Ohio. Garfield supported business interests that wanted to limit the country's money supply. He opposed labor unions and cooperative farm programs, called the Grange. Garfield also became linked to a corruption case. He accepted stock shares in a company that was building a railroad across the country. In exchange, Garfield and other top officials eased government rules so businessmen could earn higher profits for their work. Although Garfield's political career sometimes drew criticism, he continued to rise in government. When Garfield became president in March 1881, he did not have what Americans call a mandate, the approval of a large part of the population. Instead, he needed to make compromises with lawmakers to help win their support. As a result, the first weeks of his presidency were a political struggle to appoint members to his cabinet of advisors. Garfield also clashed with a powerful senator from New York State. The senator wanted to continue the tradition of permitting senators to choose who got government jobs in their states. But President Garfield wanted to put someone who shared his own beliefs in some of the top positions in New York. Finally, the senator resigned in protest. 
but the issue set the tone for Garfield's short time in office. Elected officials battled each other for advantages and financial gain. Officials in Garfield's party were accused of corruption and wrongdoing. And before Garfield could really suggest any ideas for government reform, he was shot by someone seeking a government job in exchange for his political support. On July 2, 1881, fewer than four months after he took office, Garfield was leaving for a short trip with two of his sons. They were going to take a train to Williams, the college Garfield had attended and loved. The president was supposed to give a speech there. But as he walked through the train station, a man with a gun stepped behind Garfield and shot the president twice. One bullet touched Garfield's arm. The other went into his lower back. Garfield did not die immediately. Instead, he was taken back to the White House, where doctors tried to remove the bullet. One of the men who tried was Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. Bell tried to find the bullet by using a device like a metal detector that he had invented. But the springs on Garfield's bed interfered. Neither Bell nor the doctors were able to remove the bullet. And, some historians say, their efforts may have made the situation worse. Garfield suffered for more than two months. At one point, he seemed to be recovering. But on September 19th, he finally died. He was 49 years old. As for the gunman, he was captured shortly after the shooting. His name was Charles Guiteau. Guiteau was a lawyer with little money, but many mental problems. During the election of 1880, he had first supported the candidacy of former President Ulysses S. Grant. When Garfield won the Republican nomination instead, Guiteau supported him. Guiteau did not have an official role in the election campaign, and Garfield did not know him. But over time, Guiteau came to believe that he was responsible for Garfield winning the presidency. As a result, Guiteau thought Garfield owed him a government job. Guiteau wrote the president several letters requesting positions as a diplomat in Europe. When Garfield did not write back, Guiteau grew angry. He believed Garfield was ruining the Republican Party and destroying the country. For weeks, Guiteau followed the president and plotted to kill him. When he succeeded in shooting Garfield, Guiteau believed he had performed a great service. At his trial, a jury decided that Guiteau was sane. In other words, he was not too mentally unbalanced to be responsible for his crime. Almost a year after he shot the president, Guiteau himself was hanged. Thus, the most dramatic event in James Garfield's presidency came to an end. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 